Hello and welcome to tutorial number 12. Our topic today is solutions, concentration, and osmosis. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that the notes to accompany this tutorial video are available online through my website. And with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so we said all the way back in tutorial number three that a mixture is composed of two or more pure substances that are combined. And we further said that a mixture can be subcategorized as being either homogeneous, that is uniform throughout, or heterogeneous, which is not uniform throughout. So let's just really quickly uh, write that review on the board. <clears throat> So subcategorized is either homogeneous or heterogeneous. Let's write a quick example for each. So for a homogeneous mixture, a good example would be homogenized milk. Doesn't matter if it's 1% or 2% or whole milk, uh, it's all going to be uniform throughout, so your first drink should be the same as the last drink from that glass. And a good example of a heterogeneous mixture uh, would be maybe a chunk of granite where we can actually see the variation in the minerals in that sample. Okay. What we did not say way back in tutorial three is that a homogeneous mixture can be further subcategorized as being either a solution or a colloid. Where a solution contains very small particles in the realm of uh, ions and small molecules. So let's write here small particles. So some good examples for uh, a solution would be air, um, salt water, metal alloys. Those are all very good examples for solutions. Let's write those there in blue. So examples, I'll just write EX, air, salt water, alloys. And colloids contain larger particles than solutions. So I'll just write larger particles. And some good examples of colloids would be milk. Milk is actually a colloid. And mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is a good example, I'll just write mayo, of a colloid. All right, so for today's tutorial, we are going to be focusing on solutions. I'm gonna circle that in green. And although, as you can see from the few examples we gave here, a solution can contain a combination of any of the three states of matters. Uh, we can have gases mixed with other gases, like we do in this example here for air, or we can have solids mixed with other solids, like we do in the example of different metal alloys. Uh, we can have solids uh, mixed with liquids, like the example salt water here. So any three of those states, any combination of those three states can uh, form a solution, but we will be focusing on the most common type of solution that you will be using in an introductory chemistry lab. So we will be focusing on liquid solutions, where we have either solid, liquid, or gas, or any combination of those three, uh, dissolved into a liquid. Okay, so I'll write solid, liquid, 
and or a gas dissolved into a liquid. Okay, so that will be our focus for today. So let's go ahead and erase here and go on to more details about liquid solutions. In a liquid solution, the substance that is being dissolved into the liquid is known as the solute. So let's write that up here. Solute is the substance being dissolved. Whoops. I do know how to spell that. <laughs> being dissolved into the liquid and the liquid that is dissolving the solute is known as the solvent. So let's write solvent up here. Solvent is the liquid that is dissolving the solute or solutes, plural, because you can't have more than one solute in a solution. Now we know that we can mix two substances together and not get uh, any solubility at all. We can form a heterogeneous mixture and we can mix other substances together and they'll mix completely and form a solution. So for example, if we take oil and water, we know that we're going to get two phases. We're going to get a heterogeneous mixture. We are not going to get a solution. But if we take ethanol and water, they are completely miscible in one another and we are going to create a solution. Okay. So with ethanol and water, we get a uniform phase throughout. And we do form a solution. So the question might be why? Why do some things mix and other things do not mix? The answer is that it's all dependent upon the attractive forces between your solute and your solvent. If the attractive forces between the solute and the solvent, if they are capable of the same type of intermolecular forces of attraction, then they will be soluble. If your solute and your solvent are not capable of the same type of intermolecular forces of attraction, then they will not mix. And you will end up with a heterogeneous mixture, not a solution. So you've probably heard the term like dissolves like. That's exactly what we're referring to here. Solutes and solvents with like intermolecular forces of attraction will be, dis will be soluble, and solutes and solvents that do not have similar intermolecular forces of attraction, that are not like, will not be soluble in one another. All right, so some general, uh, general statements that we can make here, two general statements that we can make. Let's make them right down here. Is that polar solutes and ionic solutes, I'm going to go ahead and include that here as well, and ionic solutes, because they contain charge. In the case of your polar solute, you've got partial positive and partial negative charge buildup. In case of your ionic solutes, you have positively charged cations and negatively charged anions. Because of those charges, uh, these are going to tend to be soluble in polar solvents, which also have that charge, that partial positive and partial negative charge buildup. Uh, tend to dissolve in polar solvent, solvents. Okay. The next general statement we're going to make 
is that nonpolar solutes tend to dissolve in nonpolar solvents. Again, like dissolves like. And we know that nonpolar solutes would not have partial positive and partial negative charge buildup, at least not permanently, uh, and neither would your nonpolar solvents. So nonpolar solutes tend to dissolve in nonpolar solvents. Okay, so like dissolves like. So let's go ahead and take a look at the dissolving process. What's actually happening on the molecular level when a substance dissolves, a solute dissolves into a solvent? Okay, so we are on slide three, the dissolving process. And we're first going to take a look at how an ionic solute will dissolve into a polar solvent. So that's right here. Ionic solute, solutes dissolving in polar solvents. When an ionic compound dissolves, the positively charged cations will be attracted to the partial negative end of the polar solvent molecules. The negatively charged anions will be attracted to the partial positive end of the polar solvent molecules. So let's write that up here. The cations will attract the partial negative, I'm going to use that uh, lowercase delta symbol there, the partial negative end of the polar solvent molecules. And the anions from the ionic compound will attract the partial positive end of the polar solvent molecules. So just a generic representation of that. So let's draw a generic cation. So remember cations have positive charge. They are positively charged and they're going to be attracting. So I'll write the dashed line to indicate my attractive force. They're going to be attracting the partial negative. Remember opposites attract. Opposite charges attract. So the partial negative end of a polar molecule. So we'll just need to indicate a generic polar molecule, partial positive charge buildup and partial negative charge buildup, the partial negative end is going to be attracted to the positively charged cations. The anions, which are negatively charged, they're going to be attracting the partial positive end of the polar solvent molecules. So let's indicate that uneven charge distribution here. Okay, so those attractive forces are known as ion dipole attractive forces. I'm going to label that ion dipole attractions. Same thing here ion dipole attractions. All right, so let's go ahead and look at a real example instead of just this generic drawing. Let's show how the ionic compound sodium chloride 
dissolves into the polar solvent water. Okay, so for our real example here, let's use sodium chloride and H2O. So our cations would be the sodium ions and the cations are going to be attracted to the partial negative end of our solvent molecules. So with an OH bond, remember it's the oxygen that is more electronegative and therefore will have the partial negative charge. So I'm going to go ahead and draw my water molecules in blue and I'm going to indicate the oxygen end which is the partial negative end oriented toward my cation, my sodium cation. So that means that the partial positive end of the water molecule, which are the hydrogen atoms, they're going to be oriented away. Now it's not just one water molecule. This sodium cation is going to be completely surrounded by water molecules with the oxygens oriented toward the sodium cation. So I'm going to draw as many as I can. I think I can fit four in here. But really imagine this sodium cation completely surrounded three-dimensionally, not just two-dimensionally like I'm drawing here on the board, but in three-dimensional space completely surrounded by these water molecules. All right, so let's do the same thing, but now for the anion, that's going to be our chloride ion. So Cl minus. And in this case, our water molecules are going to be oriented so that the partial positive end is attracting that negative chloride anion. So I'm going to show the hydrogens this time oriented toward the chloride anion. The hydrogens are going to be the partial positive end of this polar molecule. And again, completely surrounding that chloride anion. So I'm going to draw four of them again, because that's how many I can fit in here. But again, you should be imagining this three-dimensionally, completely surrounding on all sides uh, that chloride anion. We call this process solvation. We would say that the sodium cations and the chloride anions were completely solvated by that solvent water. So one more thing I want to point out before we move on to talk about how polar solutes will dissolve in polar solvents is that the, uh, the dissolving process here, and I know I've said this before, I just want to say it again, it's not a chemical change, it is just a physical change. Notice that we had sodium cations and chloride anions before in the solid state, and when they dissolved into the water, the sodium cations and chloride anions separated from one another, they got further apart, but chemically they're unchanged. Sodium cations are still sodium cations, and the chloride anions are still chloride anions. They just now have a lot of water molecules uh, around them. All right, so let's go ahead and go on to polar solutes. When a polar substance dissolves into a polar solvent, we just have the typical dipolar forces of attraction where the partial positive ends of one molecule will be attracted to the partial negative end of another molecule. So let's write that here. The partial positive ends of one molecule will attract partial negative ends of another molecule. Okay, 
So to sort of uh, show that with a diagram, let's indicate a polar molecule here, partial positive charge, partial negative charge, more electron density built up on this side, and then that molecule would be attracted to another polar molecule, the partial negative end would attract the partial positive end of another molecule, and we would call that a dipolar force of attraction. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at a real example. Let's use for our example ethanol and water. So CH3CH2OH, ethanol and H2O, two polar substances. All right, so let's go ahead and draw out the Lewis structure for ethanol. And I'll go ahead and show that bent geometry about that oxygen atom. Okay. And oxygen is a very highly electronegative element and it is going to be winning the tug of war here for the electron density as well as over here. So it's going to be our partial negative end in this molecule, leaving our hydrogen partial positive as well as this carbon. Now a carbon-carbon bond of course has a change in electron negativity of zero. It is not polar at all. And a carbon-hydrogen bond is also nonpolar. If you need to pause here and go check an electron negativity chart and just convince yourself of that, go ahead and do that. Or you can just take my word for it. There would be no other partial positive, partial negative charge buildup throughout this portion of the molecule. Okay, so here's where the polarity lies. All right. So we know that ethanol molecules could uh, attract other ethanol molecules via that dipolar force of attraction. It would actually be the special type of dipolar force of attraction known as the hydrogen bond because we have a hydrogen atom covalently bound to an oxygen. So this would be attracting other oxygen atoms from other ethanol molecules. And this oxygen would be attracting other hydrogen atoms from the OH bonds of other ethanol molecules as well. Well, it can also hydrogen bond to the solvent water. And it's going to do that, let's draw that in a different color, let's use green here, by attracting to the partial negative end, the oxygen, I'll write dash 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 for that force of attraction there, attracting the partial positive end of the water molecule. Remember that the partial positive end of an OH bond is always going to be the hydrogen. So I'm going to draw this attraction this hydrogen bond to the hydrogen atom of the water molecule. The partial positive end of this polar bond could attract, I'll use the green again, dash, 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 would be attracting the partial negative end of our polar water molecules. That would be the oxygen end. So I'm going to go ahead and write draw another water molecule here to show yet another hydrogen bond that could be forming between water and this ethanol molecule. So just to finish this off, I'm going to go ahead and draw in my partial positive and partial negative charge buildup in these water molecules so that that hopefully will help you see how the partial positive charge of the ethanol is attracting the partial negative charge of the water molecules and the partial negative charge uh, in the ethanol molecules is attracting the partial positive charge of the water molecules. All right. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and go on and talk next about how nonpolar solutes will dissolve into nonpolar solvents. So you might remember that nonpolar molecules do not have a permanent dipole like a polar molecule would have. No permanent partial positive and no permanent partial negative charge buildup in these molecules. However, 
Nonpolar molecules are still able to attract one another via London dispersion forces of attraction, which we talked about back in tutorial number 11. And those London dispersion forces of attraction result from instantaneous dipoles. And those instantaneous dipoles can, from, in one molecule can attract the instantaneous dipoles in another molecule. Okay, so let's write up here, instantaneous dipoles in one molecule attract instantaneous dipoles in another molecule. Okay, so just a quick review from that tutorial 11. So remember that a nonpolar molecule we just indicated as the two nuclei as two nuclei with electron density being shared evenly about uh, the two atoms. Okay, but we said that the electron density in a molecule can be shifted around. It's, it's always in motion. It can be shifted around and it can temporarily be shifted to one side of the molecule or the other, inducing what we call an instantaneous dipole. So I'll put a little arrow there. So now we have more partial negative charge buildup on one side of the molecule, leaving one side of the molecule partial positively charged. That's what we call an instantaneous dipole because it's not permanent. It only lasts for a moment. But the fact that it exists means that it can affect other molecules around it. inducing other instantaneous dipoles. Okay, and so it's the attractive force between those instantaneous dipoles. I'll just write dash, dash, dash right there that we're talking about here. The attractive force that is the London dispersion force of attraction. All right, so let's go ahead and look at a real example. Let's look at hexane and isooctane, which are both just composed of carbon and hydrogen. Hexane has six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, and six, and each carbon is just saturated with hydrogen. So I'm gonna draw all these lines in here as lines to my hydrogen. I hope you'll excuse me from drawing in all of these hydrogens, it's kind of tedious. So just uh, visualize that they are there. Okay, let me save time by not drawing all of them in. And then isooctane, has five carbons in a row and then branch carbons, two branch carbons off of the second carbon and then one branch carbon off of the fourth. And again, everything is saturated with hydrogen. So I'm just gonna draw all of my lines here to my hydrogen atoms, but Again, I'm gonna save myself a little bit of time by not drawing every single hydrogen atom in. And we'll learn a really fast way to dry, draw hydrocarbons in a future tutorial. I think it's uh, tutorial number 14, so it's coming up really soon. All right, so if you look at these two molecules, all we have here are carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds. Well, carbon-carbon bond is gonna have a change in electron negativity of zero, definitely nonpolar. No partial positive, no partial negative charge buildup. A carbon-hydrogen bond, you can pause here and go calculate the change in electron negativity if you like, but it's also in the nonpolar covalent range. So you can just trust me on that if you, if you like. So again, no partial positive, no partial negative charge buildup anywhere 
in either of these molecules because they're just composed of carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds, all nonpolar bonds. Okay. But the electron density can still be moved around and an instantaneous dipole can be created in these molecules. And it's the instantaneous dipoles in the hexane that can be attracted to the instantaneous dipoles created in the isooctane. Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and erase here and go on to uh, talking about concentration, slide four. So concentration refers to how much solute is dissolved in a given amount of solution. So I'm going to write that up here. Concentration refers to how much solute is in a given amount of solution. Okay, so as chemists, we like to think in moles. So our favorite concentration, our favorite unit for concentration is definitely going to be molarity. You're going to see molarity a lot in the chemistry lab. So let's talk about that first. Molarity, abbreviated capital M. Molarity tells you the number of moles of solute per one liter of solution. So the number of moles of solute in one liter of that solution. So if you have a solution of sodium hydroxide, that is 1.25 molar. When you see that capital M, that should make you think moles per liter. So that means that there are 1.25 moles of sodium hydroxide in every one liter of that solution. Okay. All right, so probably the most common unit that you'll be seeing in the chemistry lab. However, I would say in the medical field, you're probably going to see a lot more uh, units expressed in percent. So let's talk about mass volume percent next. And mass volume percent is going to be very useful when you have a solid solute dissolved into a liquid solution. And it's going to tell you the mass, the number of grams of solute, and it's percent, so it's going to be out of 100, out of 100 milliliters of solution. How many grams of solute in 100 milliliters of total solution? Okay, so normal saline is 0.90% mass volume sodium chloride. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that there would be 0.90% grams of the solute, sodium chloride, in a 100 milliliter sample of that solution. Doesn't mean that every sample you run into is going to be 100 milliliters, um, right? You could have 500 milliliters. So then in that 500 milliliters, there would be five times the 0.90. Okay. All right. So last but not least, let's see if we can squeak it in here. Let's talk about volume percent. Okay. And volume percent is going to be very useful when you have a liquid solute dissolved in a liquid solution. And it's going to give you the number of milliliters of solute. And again, it's percent. 
So always out of 100, so per 100 milliliters of solution. Okay. So if you have um, a beer that is 5% by volume ethanol, then you know that you have 5 milliliters of ethanol in every 100 milliliters of that solution or that beer. Okay. All right, so there are many, many more uh, units that we can use to express uh, concentration of a solution, but I think that these three are really good for an introductory chemistry class because molarity, that's the one you're going to see 99% of the time in your chemistry lab. Uh, however, if you're entering into any sort of allied health field, uh, these are going to be the more common units that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with your job. And if you look around on packages, look at you know your, your pimple cream or your toothpaste, you'll see that they're usually expressing the concentration of the active ingredients also in percent. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to uh, the last two points on slide four, osmolarity and dilution. So let's erase up here first. In bodily fluids, there are many particles dissolved, many different ions and different molecules dissolved. And so it's much more convenient to think about the concentration of bodily fluids and such solutions in terms of their osmolarity. So let's write up here, osmolarity. Where osmolarity tells you the number of moles of dissolved particles per liter of solution. And it's definitely related to molarity, but it's not exactly the same thing. So let's take a look at how it relates to molarity in a 1.0 molar glucose solution, a 1.0 molar sodium chloride solution, and a 1.0 molar potassium sulfate solution. Okay, so glucose molecules are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. I'm just going to draw one real quickly up here. Okay, so a glucose molecule is going to stay intact when it dissolves. It's going to dissolve by just attracting by those dipolar forces, uh, other polar solvent molecules. So we're gonna get, we can get that special type of dipolar force of attraction called a hydrogen bond. I'm just gonna write dot, 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 indicating all these different possible sites for hydrogen bonding to a polar, um, a polar solvent molecule like water. But the point is, it's that that molecule, molecules don't dissociate into multiple particles. They stay intact, typically. We will learn that acids and bases actually do dissociate, but for now, we don't know anything about that. So just think about these molecular compounds as staying intact. We looked at another example just moments ago for ethanol. The ethanol molecule, when it dissolved into the water, stayed intact. It just formed intermolecular forces of attractions to the water molecules, which allowed it to dissolve. Okay, so the molarity of a molecular compound is going to be the same as the osmolarity because when the molecular compound dissolves it stays intact it doesn't dissociate into multiple particles so here we're going to have a 1.0 osmolar solution osmolar is abbreviated osmol so the molarity and the osmolarity are actually going to be the same for this molecular compound. 
Now an ionic compound, we just looked at how an ionic compound dissolves a moment ago as well. We looked at sodium chloride in particular. Well, we know that for every one mole of sodium chloride that dissolves, we're going to get a mole of sodium cations that have separated from the chloride anions. So we're actually going to get one plus one. We're going to get two moles of dissolved particles for this ionic compound. So the osmolarity is going to be double the molarity. We're going to have a 2.0 osmolar solution. Okay. Let's look at our last example here, potassium sulfate. When potassium sulfate dissolves, the potassium cations are separated, dissociated from the sulfate anions. But look, in one mole of potassium sulfate, there are two moles of potassium cations. So for every one mole of this that dissolves, we're actually going to get two potassium cations as well as a sulfate anion. And so the osmolarity of potassium sulfate, because it releases three dissolved particles, upon dissolving it releases three particles, it's going to be triple the molarity. And so the osmolarity of this solution is going to be 3.0 osmol. All right, so that'll come back uh, to haunt us a little bit when we get to osmosis in our final slide, our final topic. So for now, let's go ahead and go on to dilutions. Chemicals often come in a concentrated solution form. And in order to use those chemicals, we must first dilute them down to the desired concentration. So we must perform a dilution. And to perform a dilution, we use the equation C1V1 equals C2V2, where C1 stands for the concentration of your initial, more concentrated solution. V1 stands for what volume of that more concentrated solution is needed. C2 stands for the concentration of your desired solution, the solution you're trying to make, the more diluted solution. And V2 is the volume of that uh, desired solution that you need. What volume do you need of that desired solution? So in reality, we usually know, well, we always know, what the concentration is of our stock solution, the solution that we have on hand. We also know what concentration we desire. We know what we need. We know what concentration we need. And we should have an idea of what volume of that solution we need as well. And so in real life application, you're typically solving for V1. You're typically solving for how much of that more concentrated solution needs to be measured out and then diluted. So I'm going to write here, this is usually what you're solving for. Okay, so if we just rearrange this equation to get V1 by itself, we're going to divide both sides by C1, and we're going to get, oops, V1. We're going to get V1 equals C2 V2 over C1. Okay, so let's say that we have a stock solution of sodium hydroxide that is 1.0 molar. Okay, so if we have 1.0 molar NaOH. And let's say uh, that we need to prepare um, 500 milliliters of a 0.25 molar sodium hydroxide solution. So I'm going to write here, we need 500 milliliters of 
0.25 molar NaOH. So what should we do? How much of that more concentrated solution so we, should we measure out and then dilute to get 500 milliliters of a 0.25 molar sodium hydroxide solution? Well, let's go ahead and figure it out. So 1.0 molar, that is our C1. That's the concentration of the solution that we have, our more concentrated solution. 0.25 molar NaOH, that is the concentration that we desire. That is our C2. That's the solution we're trying to make. And we need 500 milliliters of it. So that is our desired volume of our 0.25 molar solution. So let's go ahead and plug in and solve for V1 and figure out how to make this solution. I'll go back to the black pen here. Okay, so V1 is going to equal C2.25 molar. V2, 500 milliliters, divided by C1, which is the 1.0 molar solution. Notice that our unit of concentration is going to cancel out. In this case, we had everything in molarity, so the two solutions shown in a concentration of molarity, molarity is going to cancel out. It's going to leave us in milliliters. So let's think about that for a minute. We're trying to solve for what volume of the more concentrated solution is needed. Is milliliter a unit of volume? It is. That's a good indication that we're doing this problem right. Our units come out to be what we expect them to be, which is a unit for volume. All right, so let's grab our calculator and punch that into our calculator and figure out the answer to this problem. Okay. So we get 125 milliliters. Okay, that's our V1. That's the volume of solution of our more concentrated solution that we're going to need to measure out to prepare 500 milliliters of the 0.25 molar solution. So what we would do is we would take one hundred and twenty five milliliters of the one point oh molar sodium hydroxide solution and then we would combine it with enough solvent, probably water in this case, uh, to bring the final volume up to 500 milliliters of total solution. Okay. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and go on to uh, our final slide, which is slide five, and talk about osmosis. Certain materials, including biological membranes, are semi-permeable, meaning that they allow smaller particles to pass through while holding larger particles back. Let's write that up here. So a semi-permeable membrane. is a porous material that allows smaller particles to pass through while holding larger particles back. And osmosis refers to the flow of solvent through a semi-permeable membrane. And solvent will always flow 
from a region of lower solute concentration to a region of higher solute concentration. Let's write that down as well. Put a little hyphen here. Osmosis refers to the passage of solvent through a semi-permeable membrane. I'll just write SPM for semi-permeable membrane. And again, that solvent will flow from the region of lower solute concentration to the region of higher solute concentration. Let's write that down as well. Solvent will flow from the region of lower solute concentration to the region of higher solute concentration. So let's take a moment to draw a diagram to represent this flow of solvent from a region of lower solute concentration to the higher solute concentration because the definition doesn't always really do it, at least not for me. I am a very visual person, so pictures help me understand things much, much better. All right, so I'm gonna draw two solutions separated by a semi-permeable membrane. And on the right side, let's have just pure water, pure H2O. And since water molecules have a bent geometry, I'm going to just uh, draw my water molecules over here as little V shapes. Okay, so all water molecules on this side pure solvent that's all we have on the right side of the semi-permeable membrane okay now on the left side let's indicate some dissolved solute let's just pick glucose and we'll indicate those glucose <clears throat> molecules with these spheres Okay, so a glucose solution, and we're still going to have the solvent, our solvent will be water again, on this side of the <clears throat> semi-permeable membrane. So I'm going to go ahead and indicate some water molecules in between those glucose uh, solute particles, and they would be hydrogen bonding to one another, so the glucose would be dissolved in the water through hydrogen bonding. And so we're going to have a net flow of the solvent, water, from the region of the lower solute concentration, which is our right side, to the region of the higher solute concentration, which is our left side in this particular diagram. So it's not that water can't flow in both directions. It can, and it will it's that more water molecules will be moving from right to left than there are water molecules moving from left to right. So let's indicate that with the green. I'm going to show a water molecule moving from the right to the left. Let's show this one going from the left to the right. And then I'm just going to show a bunch more moving from the right to the left because there would be more moving uh, from the right to the left. So let's show one, two, three, four going from the right to the left and only two 
moving from the left to the right. So overall, a net flow, more water molecules moving from the right side to the left, from the region of the lower solute concentration to the region of the higher solute concentration. Why? Well, hopefully you can see from this diagram that there are simply going to be more water molecules coming into contact with our semi-permeable membrane on the right side in the pure water solution. There will be fewer water molecules, fewer solvent molecules coming into contact with the semi-permeable membrane on the left side because we have more solute in that solution, a higher solute concentration, therefore fewer water molecules coming into contact with the semi-permeable membrane and therefore fewer water molecules moving in that direction. And that results in our net flow from the lower solute concentration side to the higher solute concentration side. And that flow is going to continue until the pressure builds up to what's called the osmotic pressure and then the net flow of the solvent molecules will halt. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and erase all of this and go on and finish up um, slide number five. So red blood cells have an osmolarity of 0 0.30 osmol. Let's write that up here. I'm gonna write RBC for red blood cells. So to maintain homeostasis, red blood cells must be surrounded by solutions that are isotonic, that is, have the same osmolarity as the inside of those red blood cells. Other solutions that are also 0 0.30 osmol. So it's right to maintain homeostasis, red blood cells must be surrounded by an isotonic solution. That is a solution with the same osmolarity. So as long as the osmolarity of the surrounding solution, the blood plasma or an intravenous solution, whatever it may be, as long as it is isotonic, as long as it is also 0 0.30 osmol, then the same number of water molecules that are flowing out of a red blood cell, that will equal the number of water molecules that are flowing in, and overall there will be no change to the concentration within the red blood cell. However, if those red blood cells are placed in a hypotonic solution, hypo meaning lower tonicity, so a solution that is less than the 0 0.30 osmol. Okay, so let's indicate that with a drawing here. We have a red blood cell, which is 0.30 osmol, and then the surrounding solution here is a less than 0.30 osmol. Then we're going to get a net flow of solvent into the red blood cells. We're going to have a swelling and potentially even a bursting of those red blood cells. Let's write here. Solvent will have a net flow into the red blood cells, causing swelling. Put that in parentheses, causes swelling. Okay, so think about that and what we know about osmosis that the solvent will always have a net flow from the region of lower solute concentration 
that would be surrounding the red blood cell in this case, to the region of the higher solute concentration. So therefore, an overall net flow into the red blood cells. If red blood cells are placed in a hypertonic solution, hyper meaning a greater tonicity, so something that is greater than 0.30 osmol. So again, let's draw a picture here. Our red blood cell is 0.30 osmol, and now our surrounding solution is greater than 0.30 osmol. Then we're going to have a net flow of solvent out of the red blood cell into the surrounding solution, and those red blood cells are going to start to shrivel. Okay, so let's write here solvent will have a net flow out of the red blood cells and this causes the red blood cell cells to shrivel. Okay. So let's indicate that, let's use a blue pen here, let's indicate that net flow. So it's not that anything's, a uh, solvent's not moving in, it is, it's that there's overall more solvent moving out. So I'll put three arrows out with only one arrow in. So that net flow out of the red blood cell. Let's do the same thing up here. I forgot to do that up here. So solvent can move both ways, but in this case, in a hypotonic solution, we're going to have more solvent moving in, and less solvent moving out, so overall a net flow out of, or excuse me, net flow into the red blood cells. Okay. All right. So we're going to go ahead and conclude our tutorial number 12 right here, and I hope that you will consider tuning into problem set number 12 where we can work lots of problems. There's lots of calculations that we need to work on for concentration, dilution, uh, as well as a lot of concepts. So do turn into uh, problem set number 12. Thank you.